The least understood or least applied principle of behavioral science, in my opinion, is cognitive scripts. A script is nothing more than a template for a sequence of actions that will take place time and time again when somebody interacts with a business or service. Hence, it's in imperative that you, at the outset of a customer forming their relationship with you, enable them to create a script that is comprised of the highest value actions that they can take inside of your ecosystem. That way, over and over again, when they engage with you over their lifetime as a customer, they're gonna continuously perform the highest value actions. Hence, focus on architecting a interaction or an onboarding process for your new customers that model the actions of your highest value customers so your new customers learn to use your service in the same way that your highest value customers do. The most um, underrated uh, human bias is uh, cognitive fluency. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, um, the concept behind cognitive fluency is that when you make um, an environment, whether it's a digital environment or physical environment, um, difficult for people, um, uh, it actually causes them to slow down and try to reassess the situation because it sets off this kind of cognitive alarm in our brains. And in contrast, when you make something cognitively fluent, uh, it's easy for people to understand and comprehend, and it's going to make, make it that much more likely for them to take the desired action that you have. And um, when we're thinking about um, cognitive fluency in the context of marketing um, pieces that we design, there's two key aspects. So one is on the messaging side, that we want to make sure there's cognitive fluency there. And Joanne, I'd love to understand what are the uh, things that you think about making um, cognitive fluency content. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's critical to good messaging. Um, if you want people to be able to make a gut decision, you need to make it as easy as possible to understand what you're saying. And you can't just march ahead with whatever description the company has given you, how they describe the environment and the solution and the problem. You actually need to talk to the customers and see how, what words they're using because it's far more familiar when you use those words back to them that they'll understand immediately what you're talking about. So you need to you need to simplify. You need to use words that are appropriate to the level of the audience that you're that you're speaking with, and you just need to make it easy easy for them to digest it. Yeah, so uh, uh, we call it a going outside of the bubble. Um, so the bubble is usually the environment where you're sitting with with the client, coming up with uh, messaging and actually going and talking to the audience and Absolutely. figuring out what language they use. Uh, awesome, and it also obviously shows up really importantly in design. Uh, so, Pete, what are some of the elements that you think about when you're trying to introduce cognitive fluency into a design? When I approach a new design piece, um, I want to make sure I understand what the primary goal is of the piece. Um, I want to establish a hierarchy with minimal distractions. Um, and to do this, I use a couple of principles. I, I um, use contrast, typography, and color um, to make sure the design or UI is cognitive, cognitively fluent. Awesome. Uh, and while we recognize that you might not always have um, an amazing designer on staff, but I think the principles are true of like really paying attention to the elements of your design and how that affects the cognitive fluency. Right. And then when you have an environment that has really great copy and really great design that isn't distracting to the user, then you can take your behavioral science intervention and drop it in and be assured that you are leveraging loss aversion or you're leveraging endowment um, instead of having the user be distracted by the environment. So I think there are probably two that lend themselves well to interventions that we underuse. The first is leveraging social connectedness. I don't think we think very often or well about the influence that people's social networks have on them. Not online social networks, but actually friends and family. So the idea is how do we leverage social spillover and people influencing people? And specifically, people helping people. In my research, I focus on the social network of adults who care about kids to support kids' achievement. Uh, but you can see this in lots of different domains. And I don't think we immediately put that on the list of behavioral tools for helping people make better choices. And the second one is procedural fairness. So procedural fairness is people's perception that the process that led to a rule or an outcome was fair and impartial. There are a bunch of components to it, like process control and neutrality and um, trust. 
But I, I think that we don't think of that as a tool for behavioral interventions when a lot of what we are interested in doing, whether it's increasing tax compliance, increasing student behavior in class, uh, decreasing littering, even increasing medication adherence and prescription compliance. Uh, I think procedural fairness is a tool that I don't think we appreciate enough when we develop interventions. I think an underappreciated principle in behavioral economics is the power of relativity. Now, relativity is generally appreciated, but the extent by which it drives our decisions is not. Let me give you an example. So imagine you had to choose between living in a house that was 5,000 square feet, but all of your neighbors lived in houses that were 6,000 square feet. Or you could live in a house that was 3,000 square feet, but all of your neighbors lived in houses that were 2,000 square feet. What would you choose? Well, most people actually choose the smaller house. Why? Because our intuition is that if all of our neighbors had bigger houses than us, it would make us sad, pretty disappointed. You look, you look over and you're like, Jane's got a bigger house. It kind of makes me feel like I'm not doing well enough or I need to improve. Maybe I need to work harder. Uh, so our intuition is that other people will determine our, some of our happiness. And this actually turns out to be correct. These houses are what's called positional goods. And positional goods help drive consumption because we quickly understand how we're doing. 